So just how big is a mature whitetail buck's range? How does killing a buck or doe affect the rest of the herd? Our guest today shed some light on these questions and more. The Rack Factor Podcast is next. Welcome to the Rack Factor Podcast, where we discuss the factors that lead to bigger bucks and a healthier deer herd. The Rack Factor Podcast is presented by Rack Fuel Premium Deer Nutrition. From premium deer mineral to deer feed, premium food plot seed to deer attractant, Rack Fuel products maximize the health and potential of your deer herd year round. Visit rackfuel.com and fuel your herd. Our guest today is a hardcore bow hunter, land consultant, and co-host of the TV show, Own the Season. He also has a ton of whitetail deer knowledge that he likes to share as a seminar speaker. Our buddy Art Helen joins us on the Rack Factor podcast. And hey, Art, how you doing today? I'm doing good. Getting through a few technical difficulties, but uh, once we get through the technical difficulties, life's pretty good. So we're all right. Nice. Good to see you, Art. Good to see you, sir. You're a land manager, not an IT guy. We we know that, so uh, you know all's forgiven. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm a land management guy and not an IT guy, or we'd both, we'd be sinking ships. I can tell you that. <laughs> all right. So hey, you've been you've been hunting whitetails pretty much your whole life. Uh, when did you just stop hunting whitetails and actually become a student of the whitetail deer? Well, I never really stopped. I just kind of changed my changed my focus on things you know it was weird because i really got into the whole hunting um scene through my grandma my um my dad hunted but he didn't hunt a lot and uh so my my grandma would pick me up every day from school she would take me out and we would go out to the state park and look at deer and ducks and all these different things and got me into photography and then kind of um started talking about you know, grandpa hunting, you know, he hadn't done it in a long time and different things. And said, you know, really talk to your dad about trying to get you into this. So he did. And of course, back then it was a whole different ball game. You know, you're young, you're gung ho. You just, you want to go out and shoot things. You don't care if it's a spike, you don't care if it's a doe, if it's, you know, if it was legal and it was brown, it was down. That's the way, you know, that's the way it worked. And, um, over the years, as quality deer management really started to take place and started to go forward, you know, I, I really started looking at what is, what is the driving force behind that? And a lot of it was, you know, antler size. We have to go to antler size. Well, after doing a lot of research myself and talking to a lot of different whitetail biologists, the true factor is, is age. So once you start looking at age, now you have to become a student of the game. And the game, whitetail game, is, as you guys know, is a 24-7, 365 game. It's you don't get out there tomorrow and uh, shoot a 200-inch deer just because. Um, I shouldn't say that because there are some people that will say, I did. I was smoking in my tree stand and thing walked by and, you know, I shot it. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> that just doesn't work for me, right? Uh, and so I try to be the student of the game and, and do that. So probably I'm guessing – you know, 15, maybe 20 years ago, uh, when I first purchased our land about 20 years ago, that's when I really became a student of the game of, of the game and the deer and, and trying to learn them uh, and figure them out. So how did you become involved with the Wisconsin uh, DNR five-year collaring program? Well, so that was, that was a little different. Um, one day out of the blue, I had uh, the guy at the time, his name was Wes. He had called me and he says, hey, do you uh, you want to become part of this? Because I know you're really into the management and the age thing and, and trying to figure these deer out. He says, would you like to um, help us collar some deer on your property and one of the properties that I hunted? And I said, well, what's it really consist of first before I really get into this and what are we doing with it? And the true collaring program is a program for predation studies and for CWD studies. It was to see what's really killing these deer. How old are they making it? Um, are they making it to three? Are they making it to seven? You know, what is the 
average age that these deer are making it? Are they being shot by hunters? Are they being hit by cars? You know, what is doing what? And so when he explained that program to me, I said, well, what benefits do I really get out of it if I go out there and do this? I said, you know, what, what can I learn? What can I do? So we had a more in-depth conversation about it. And he says, all right, this is what happens. All the deer that we collar with you on your place and the land that I hunt, he says, from usually the end of January through the first part of the summer, I have access to those animals. Okay, I can go up to the DNR office. I can look at where the tracker was, look at all the tracking data, find out, you know, if I was doing land management work, what are they really doing? Are they really using this food source? Are they really using timber stand improvement or are they doing hinge cut areas? What are they really doing and have the deer tell you that? And so when he explained that, you know, I had that information or I could go in there, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, sign me up, man. I, I'm in for this because now I'm inside the brain of a, of a deer, a mature deer when it gets to that point. Yeah, that's super interesting. All right. So I guess my first and, and really obvious question is how the heck do you, does the DNR, how, how do you collar those deer? Well, that's uh that was the interesting part of it. So that's what I said. I said, do we get to sit in my tree stand and shoot them with a tranquilizer? What, what are we doing here? And right. so he showed me these nets and I'm like, how do you catch them in a net? So you go out and you set up, it looks like a huge circus tent, but it's a net. There's a pole in the middle. It goes way out and it's either got a remote control with a little blast on top. You hit and it drops or, and so these things are like 30 yards by 30 yards or bigger. And you put them out in the food plot. Really? And so then we go up and we climb up into our tree stands and you have an entire group of people there that are the DNR biologists. You have um, their volunteers and you have their biologists that have more of a vet background to them. And so then you wait, these deer come walking in, you set the trigger off, this net drops on them. Everybody piles out from where they are, their stands, their, you know, hiding blinds out and jump on top of this deer to get this deer to settle then they sedate it and then after they sedate it then they start doing um all these different tests on it they can do live tests for cwd they can do um you know age tests on them obviously you know is it pregnant is it not pregnant all these different things if it's a doe and so they go through all these and they age them and then they write all this information down then they put a tracking collar on it wakes up and away it goes. And um, it was pretty neat to actually watch it the first time and see how it was all done. And uh, you know, when you, when you get a three or four year old buck in there, <laughs> I'm telling you what, I'm not a small guy, but trying to jump on top of those deer and hold those things down, man, you you hope you're not the one up close to the antlers. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> So there's a few scar scar tissues out there, I'm sure, from a few of them that uh, found out real quick that they're a pretty powerful animal. So what did you learn about a white-tailed deer's range from this study? You know, looking at it, it was actually pretty incredible. Um, and I know one of the studies that they released, but there, there are so many of them that we looked at. And then one of the big ones is I learned that as a deer matures, their home range becomes smaller and they become like ghosts, even in that small home range. It's amazing how their home range shrinks over the years, but how much more difficult it is to actually hunt it because they understand that home range so well that they know when you're there and when you're not there. And it was just crazy to watch it, but that really starts transitioning you know, in that three, four-year-old, usually about that four-year-old, that range will start shrinking. Um, the only time that it gets bigger, so one of the deer that was collared, I remember this study. So there was about 800 and, I want to say it was like 850 or 875 deer that were captured and collared, okay, um, out of the, over the five years. Bucks, there was a bunch more does too, but there were just that many bucks that were collared. Now, I remember the study on one that was a four-year-old buck. And when he hit four years old, his summer range 
consisted of approximately 200 acres. That was it. Okay, he lived basically on 200 acres. November came around, he expanded that to between six and 700 acres. He lived through the rut again. Once winter came, it shrunk to 100 acres. And then the following year at five years old, he only branched out to between 100 and 150 acres. So it all of a sudden started getting smaller, you know, at five years old, he was another 50 acres smaller. And so to me, that just, you know, boggle my mind because you hear all these things, that, oh man, this deer runs, you know, a million miles. Now, the one thing on that that really is interesting that I learned is that if you shoot a doe or if a doe dies, now you don't necessarily have to shoot it, but if there is a doe there and has an oven buck with her, okay, she dies from disease, from being shot, from hit by a car, whatever, that nub and buck will stay in that home range where that buck was born. If mom still lives and she fawns again the next spring, when she has that new fawn, she kicks that nub and buck out. That nub and buck, from the studies that we that I had seen personally, um, would end up on average, anywhere from two and a half to four miles away is where it would make its new home range. The farthest that we had that I saw documented was 27.3 miles. Okay, it went, what? Yes, it traveled 27.3 miles. It traveled wow. the entire length, well, not the entire length, obviously, the Wisconsin River, but I'm down here by the river. It went from our place to the river, and then it turned and went all the way up towards Madison, Wisconsin, made its home in a whole different county and then got hit by a car when it was three years old. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, so they do, they travel a long ways, a lot more than you think. But again, the, the neatest thing with that is watching it and how, as they got older, that buck range kept getting smaller and smaller. So what that taught me was even with the deer that we didn't have collared, is that if I can get the head deer on my property, if if he comes back year after year and all of a sudden he hits that four years old or five years old, and I consistently have, that means that's his home range. That's where he's going to be. So now I right. can hunt that deer a lot smarter. You know, I can hunt him harder and I can hunt him smarter because that's where he's going to be. It's just now they're, they're – um, they're a lot smarter, so they've figured you out too. So you, now you have to learn all your entrance and exits and everything else and, and really study that and figure that out, not to tip him off. Because even while tipping him off, and we saw that in some of the studies, it was kind of funny watching you knew when hunting season was starting, close to di close to rifle season, because you watch those old mature deer, watch their patterns, and – so they've in that collar they ping okay it sends back a tracking ping um every 15 minutes to a half hour so you can actually follow that deer everywhere he goes all day long 24 7 okay usually those collars last about two years to two and a half years at the most some of them don't even last that long and the batteries die things happen but with that deer um as soon as rifle season and all that pressure started you could see where that deer was in his natural home range and all of a sudden that pressure would come in and they would shrink. I mean, they would shrink their home range even smaller for the next nine days to two weeks and they would actually stay almost in the same place and you could talk to the hunters and go, huh, I remember looking at a buck that I was trying to kill and after season I looked at this and I'm like, there is no way that that deer was right there. Absolutely no way, because I hunted this stand five days for rifle season, and I never once saw that deer. And that deer basically lived within 20 acres of me that entire nine days and got up and moved. And he would move when I would move or when I would leave or something else. So he had me figured out in pattern. And it was just crazy looking at that and figuring that out because of watching all the other deer. So... That's one thing that really that whole study um, had taught me was, you know, how to concentrate on those older deer and what they're really doing. It also taught me a lot about my land management stuff. 
what food plots, you know, and, and what f- seeds to, to start planting and how to change all my food plots and, and give them things for different times of the year and what they really liked and what they didn't, you know, especially, like I said, with timber stand improvement, TSI work, um, or your hinge cuts, different things, uh, your en- exit routes and um, entrance routes. It, it really changed all that and, and how, how you think and how you really get in the mind of that older deer and go, hmm, you know, this, this is what I really have to do. And uh, to kind of give you an idea of that real quick, um, so I don't go on for 300 years because I know you'll have other questions, <laughs> but the, uh, like I said, white-tailed deer, I could talk about white-tailed deer all day, all day, guys, especially big deer. But to, to kind of put it in perspective with how these things work and how an older deer becomes more patternable, um, everybody says they're harder to kill. They are harder to kill because they're smarter but they are patternable. And if you can figure that out where that pattern is, truly they are, aren't as hard as you think they are to kill. You know, they, they actually get pretty easy at certain times of the year. Why they're still on patterns early season, rut gets pretty tough because they figure it out and then late season again. And I always say, you know, you look at it compared to people, all right? When you look at teenage kids, you know, that's your one and a half, two and a half year old buck. You know, they're always running around trying to figure it out. And I, you know what? I'm going to go to the driving again because this really cute girl's up there. And so they keep driving up there all the time. And then what happens is right at 1030 at night when she's done with her shift, her 18-year-old or 20-year-old boyfriend drives in and picks her up and away they go. <laughs> you know, that's that three-and-a-half-year-old or four-and-a-half-year-old that's been around the block a few times and already figured this stuff out. They're still not patternable because some nights he might be out with his buddies and not show up till 11 o'clock or 1130. But once they start getting older, they even get more patternable and set in their ways. And I look at my dad and I love my dad dearly and I still hunt with my dad and do things with him. But if I wanted to hunt my dad, I would put a tree stand in the quick trip parking lot at 745 every morning (laughs) because I know that's where my dad is going to be. Okay. He's got to be there to get his coffee and his blueberry muffin. And if he doesn't get his blueberry muffin and his coffee, dad gets a little testy. Okay. So I know that that's where he's going to be and what's going to happen. So it's the same thing with deer. I mean, they get set in their ways, they do their things. And so that's how you try to figure them out is how, how are they really doing this and how are they traveling? And some of it's weather dependent too, you know, so there's a lot of factors in it, but that's the biggest thing that that study really, um, you know, gave, made me really think about these deer and how they travel and what they really do. So that was the biggest takeaway from that. So what data surprised you the most? You know, there was a lot of data that um, surprised me and, and some of the data that really surprised me was the age when these deer would get killed, you know, you could see them if it was hit by a car, if it was predation or what it was, um, you know, we got to go up and a lot of them we got to see, or you'd see the picture of it dead because they'd collar, take a pit, you know, take the collar off and take pictures of and stuff to see the difference in antler growth in different mature deer. That part of the study really kind of blew my mind because there's so many, things out there people oh you know when it hits five years old it's going to be a booner Eh, not not necessarily and i really found that out you know with this study because you know i look at it and um i see guys that are 50 years old or 52 years old like myself and i'm like okay that dude needs to really start eating or he's never going to become a booner you know (laughs) He's, he's always going to be 140 pounds soaking wet and that's just genetics that's the way it works And so that really kind of, when that deer would be taken into a registration station and they would be, Hey, you know what? I just killed this. It's got to be a five-year-old deer. The DNR is lying to me. It's not a two and a half year old. No, that's a two and a half year old, 145 inch deer. He just had great genetics, you know? And then the next time somebody would bring in 115 or 120 inch deer, they'd say, yeah, according to the study, that's five-year-old deer. They are now you guys don't know what you're talking about. And well, here's all the data right here. And so the data on that kind of really 
um, opened my eyes too to what's really happening. The other part of the data that surprised me was how does usually go back to the same area to fawn every year. That kind of surprised me watching how even if they would disperse and go somewhere a mile or two miles away all the time, they would always come back to that same fawning area. And so every year what we'd do is we'd watch that data until they were fawning. And as soon as we'd see that doe in that area, we'd get a big group of people together. We'd go out and sweep that area, find that fawn. And then we would take that fawn and we would collar that fawn and tag that, ear tag that. So, you know, then you just continually keep getting data on these things. And now the study's done. Uh, last 2020, the winter of 2020 was the last year of the five-year study. And uh, we have a seven and a half year old doe that is still fawning and kicking on our place that every year she's back in the same place. And um, she was the first one that we collared on our place and she's still there. Wow. So, so do you remember how many deer total ended up being collared over the course of that five year study? I want to say, like I said, it was 850 or 875 bucks. And I want to say it was like 930 or 940 does. So approximately 17, 1800 um, throughout that time frame. And, and how broad or how big was that? Was that over many counties? Um, obviously, you don't have that many deer on your 40 acres, but. No, <laughs> no. Yeah, it was. It was a pretty big, big area. I mean, it was part of Sauk County, part of Iowa County. Um, there was some over in Grant County. I don't know if they got all the way down to Lafayette County, but I know they did some in Dane County too. So, you know, it was four or five different counties that they did it in. And, uh, you know, they found some pretty big tracks. I know one of the tracks, um, that I did some land management work on one year, I actually got them to get on that. And that was an 800 acre piece and they trapped quite a few deer in there. And, uh, you know, I, I know some of the deer that got shot out of there. Um, one of the bucks that was there got shot 18 and a half miles away as a four-year-old deer. And um, they had lost him at two years old. His collar went, got ripped off or got, um, it was just kind of, there wasn't much of it left. You know, broke open and ripped off, but still had ear tags. So when a guy shot that deer and they went and checked it, they said, oh, this is this deer. This is his, you know, his numbers. This is where he got tagged at. Um, we lost him at two years old, moving that way. We don't know where he ever ended up, but that's where he must have, at two years old, got that ripped off of him when he was actually changing home ranges and going to that area. So you touched on food a little bit. Um, you said you were able to kind of extrapolate some some data from you know, age structure and, and what older bucks like to eat as they mature. Can you be a little bit more specific about what you found and in, in kind of what you walked away with from that? You know, it was, um, it wasn't really what they eat. It was more at what times of the year that they're doing things and changing. Um, you know, there was some of what they eat in different areas of the counties and stuff, which kind of surprised me. You know, there were areas that some areas they would really hit, you know, sugar beets, brassicas, things like that really hard. And then there were other ones that wouldn't hit it until February or March. Um, but the biggest is in the transition times. And so I've, I've kind of changed my food plot mentality a little bit uh, because of that. You know, a lot of people want to go beans. They want to go corn. Um, and then they want to put in maybe some clover, different things around that, right? And say, yeah, I've got a food plot in. The The issues with some of that that I found out, usually about hunting season, first, second week of September in Wisconsin anyway, other areas in October, first part of October, what happens is the silk dries up on that corn, the bean leaves start falling off, and they're in those, they want the bean leaves. They want the protein. They aren't eating the beans yet. They really want the protein out of those leaves, right? So that's what they're really in there eating, and all of a sudden that dries up or the leaves turn yellow. They don't taste good anymore. They're up and gone, disappeared um, just before season. So 
I hear that all the time from people. Well, I, I'm watching these big deer out in my bean field. When did you plant it? Well, I planted it when the farmer planted it. <laughs> well, you better find another food source because he's not going to be there opening day, right? I always, if I'm doing that, I like to plant them a couple weeks later so that they still stay green come opening day. But what I've learned, and then clover, of course, if we get an early frost, it might go dormant for a week or something before it starts popping back up. Well, that could be in October in Wisconsin and Minnesota and those areas. So alfalfa usually stays good until it's like 10 degrees um, because it what it does is the top of the frost, then it lays over the top and insulates it. And then that's what keeps that bottom green under there. So I like to change and, and I'll put in like clover alfalfa mixes. Um, I will take and uh, put in brassicas. I'll go through my beans or my corn if I put those in at all. Uh, this year I don't have any of those um, because I'm trying to switch things over. So I go in with my brassica mixes and I'd put those over my corns, corn and beans or I'll just go and put do two different types of brassicas because they'll mature at different times. So when those deer all of a sudden leave those or your neighbor's, uh, if he's a farmer, they leave those fields, you're giving them those food sources when they want food but don't have it in those areas. So they're out roaming looking for it. So it really got me thinking about, okay, what do I really need to put in my food sources to give them that 365 days to try to keep them there as long as possible? I mean, on my 40, I'm not going to keep all my deer there. Obviously, they're going to go to some of the farmer's fields, but I also want them back. So in the summer is my big transition time. I want, in the spring, I want my clovers and alfalfa there right away. So that's already growing. I run the outside edges of my fields that way, or I'll put regular fields in like that. Okay. Um, half acre, you know, quarter acre fields of that. So that way... Those deer are there right away in the spring. In the summer, they disperse and they go to the bean fields, they go to other fields, which is fine by me because I'm just starting to get all my bucks back. You know, that's what I really like is waiting until July. If my bucks start showing up mid-July to end of July, those are deer that are coming back to their home range or deer I'm going to have, okay? I want to do that because now what's happening is, is that corn's growing, things are happening, those deer are going to start moving, looking for other food sources, especially here in the next month. All of a sudden, that's all going to dry up. Right now, we're kind of dry here, so they're looking for that green. They're looking for that clover alfalfa. They're looking for what brassicas and stuff are just starting to pop, and so they're moving into those. And I learned that, you know, through that study is watching these deer and go, well, they've got all this food right here. Why are they leaving it? And then you look at aerial maps of where the trail leads, you go, oh, okay. So what was in this food source? And you check it out and you go, all right, well, that makes sense. You know, they're going from something that's, you know, stagnant in growth or something that's drying up to something that's green, palatable, and and good in protein. So that's how I've really changed that. And, and it really made me aware of, okay, we can't just put in one type of food source. We can't just put in a fall. We can't just put in a spring. We need something there so that they know if something happens next door that they're always going to have a food source there. You came in contact with a lot of different mature bucks, uh, different age classes. Um, I imagine you learned a lot about what their their habits are. Like you said, as, as you get older, you, you tend to you know, get stuck in your ways, become more patternable. You said something interesting to me once that, you know, there's certain times of the year where, where you're not going to step foot on your property. You're not going to be going in there and, and planting, or you're not going to be going in there and checking trail cameras. W what's your theory based on kind of what you learned through this study about human intrusion as it pertains to mature bucks? And, and when do you stop going into those areas on your property? Well, you know, there's certain areas when I set up properties and when I set up my own, as I make it so I have pretty easy ingress and egress to my food sources so that I can do work in there with what I have to. But as far as hanging tree stands, just going out and messing around, having fun doing things, um, I'm done. My tree stands are already hung. 
I want everything done by July 1st, um, the 15th of July at the absolute latest. One thing I learned from that study is all your mature deer, once you get into mid-July, they start breaking off from the younger bucks trying to find their home range again or get back to their home range. Some stay a little longer into August, but if you really truly look at it, um, one of the biggest things that kind of cracks me up every year is I, I look at a lot of trail camera pictures and a lot of different things on um, Facebook and different uh, uh, management type um, Facebook groups that I'm in. And uh, it kind of cracks me up every year. These guys will post a picture of a 140 or 150 inch deer um, August 5th and go, man, he's still got another month to grow. Eh, no, he's done. You know, I look at that and go, he's done. He's, you know, if he's, unless he has like black knobs, still looks like little balls on the top of his antlers or on the end of his beams, he's done. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they're what they are because now what happens is they have to dry up. That, that horn has to harden underneath there. Um, it has to become hard. Then that velvet has to dry up and then they have to take that and rub that off. That is not an overnight process. You know, that's a two to three week process to have that happen. There are some late comers that will grow, you know, into the second week of August. Um, and I could probably be proved wrong and some guy, because everybody's got to prove somebody wrong, would say, here, look, this one grew until the end of August. Okay. You know, there's exceptions to every rule. But the majority of them, by the end of July, first part of August, they're done growing. And so they are out now. Um, you know, starting because that antler is starting to get to what it is, they're starting to look for that home range. But once you hit the end of July, that first part of August, when they've hit that, and now their testosterone is starting to build more and more to, to harden that horn, now is when they're really trying to find that home range, break off from those smaller bucks and do their thing. And so I don't want to be in the woods at that time. If I need to work on a food plot, something like that, that's fine. I'll go in on my, you know, my UTV or my tractor, um, and drive right by them and usually it doesn't bother them but if I'm trying to hang stands things like that you know those old mature deer you might get away with it once but you try doing it twice and they disappear you know and um, I always said this is kind of the funny saying in my seminars unless you're from Illinois but from Wisconsin we always say that no good brother-in-law is from Illinois right and uh, so we um the the thing was is if I had heard it so many times and before this study came out, and then after the study, it kind of really brought light to it really does happen is these guys would find, get a picture of a big deer, right? And they'd get it in August. And all of a sudden now, what do they do? They're in there constantly every day, checking that trail camera before we had cell cameras. So they're in there checking it every day or every other day. And I'm like, why are you guys checking your cameras? Well, I don't know if he's still there. Well, if you check it in a week from now, your SD card, yeah, but what if the SD card fails? I got to know if it's there. <laughs> All of a sudden, after that first week of them being in there every day, they say, now I can't find that deer. He's gone. I don't see him anymore. And then opening day, so now they hunt it twice as hard. They're in there twice as hard because they want to find this deer, right? So now they're all over their entire property trying to find this deer, really messing it up. Then on opening day of rifle season, they get a call from their neighbor, it's that no good brother-in-law is from Illinois, right? He's never been there all year. First day ever in this property, 40 acres away. And he calls him up and says, hey, Joe, you ever seen this buck? I mean, this thing's a giant. I've never seen him before. First day I've been here this year, and look at this thing that I shot. Well, that's because there was no intrusion over there. Nobody bothered him, and that's where he set up camp. And then they come in and shoot it. So it's once this time of year comes... I'm checking cameras or I'm checking cell cameras. All my sanctuaries have cell cameras in them. I am out of there from now until mid-January. Will not step foot in it. Um, if a deer goes in there that's been shot, then I obviously have no choice. But uh, I won't go in there. Um, I'll go to my food plots or my, my stands, and that's it, you know, from here on out. So what's the most common myth about whitetails? that they're all going to be 200 inches. 
I mean, seriously, right. it really is. I mean, I hear people say, if you let this deer go to be a mature six-year-old deer, he's going to be a Boone and Crockett. No, he's not. Um, he never will. It's a lot of it's genetics. Um, and getting there, it's food source, it's genetics, giving them the right food. Um, in, in certain states, um, Kansas, Iowa, Kentucky, some of these where you can feed mineral and, and keep them healthy, um, you know, they have a better chance of growing those. Uh, you get in certain areas in Wisconsin that have it naturally in their soils, they have better deer. So they have the genetics, but then on top of that, once you give them the proper food, away you go. Um, also keeping your deer numbers in check because people say it's always, you know, it's going to be a booner. Well, here's the deal. If you have a five to one ratio and five does to every one buck, those does, if you watch at a certain time of year, and I learned this through the study too, she has precedence to your food, to your water, to anything she's doing with her fawns. She will take every buck and run them off, okay? That that fawn has to eat and has to drink. So they are taking the cream of the crop food source. They are taking the best minerals. They're taking the best protein. They're getting the best water, everything else. So if you don't, if you have way too many of those does and fawns on your property and the bucks keep getting second and third best, they're not, they may have the genetics, but they're not going to grow that antler that they really truly should. And that's where food sources, um, if you can use minerals, if you can use feed, um, are a really important part in, in growing that deer and getting him to the potential that he really should be at. So that's the biggest myth. I hear that all the time. You know, it's don't shoot that deer until he's seven years old or six years old because he's going to be a booner. He's... Some will, yes, but some won't. And the sad part is, if you look at it through the studies and everything else, Milo Hansen's deer was only three and a half years old, the world record. Okay. Um, so if you look at that, man, I tell you what, it's uh, deer grow huge by three years old. So you really can't, if you know what they are, managing, truly managing your deer herd, you know, you go by age, not by antler size, because if you go by antler size only, and I ran into this doing a seminar once too, I was talking about age versus antlers. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this young kid came up to me afterwards and he says, you know, that was interesting. He said, um, I hope my dad really listened. And I said, why is that? He says, well, I quit hunting three years ago because my dad told me no one can shoot a buck off our farm unless it's over 150 inches. And I said, okay, I said, well, how many deer have you guys ever killed over 150 inches on your farm? He says, well, we only own 55 acres. We've only shot one in the last 11 years. And I'm like, well, that's why he's quitting, you know, because he's not having fun anymore. And we have deer that are four years old that are 110 inch deer, 120 inch deer, and a four-year-old over here that's, you know, 160 or 155-inch deer, which, granted, is very difficult to pass up. But I would rather, you know, pass up that 150-inch three- or four-year-old and kill that 120-inch four-year-old and let that other one, you know, get that age on him one more year and see what he can do. He might be a booner. He may not. He may put on 10 more inches is all. But once they hit that magic five years old, some of them four years old because I've got some neighbors that when they get to four years old, if, you know, they say, hey, man, that thing's 160-inch deer, 150-inch deer, they're like, I'm shooting that deer. Well, you know, it's uh, sometimes I take my chances and go, yeah, last year I took my chances on a couple of them that were like that. They were three- and four-year-old deer, and they made it through. You know, they got through the gauntlet and made it. So, um, sometimes you just have to hope. And, um, and if you don't, and your neighbor shoots it, you know what, you don't own the deer anyway. He's not yours. He jumped the fence. It's legal for him to shoot it. Yeah. Can it get frustrating as a manager? Yeah, I can, but I'm not paying his taxes. I'm not paying, you know, his license fees or anything else. So, you know, be happy for him and, 
say congratulations and move on to the next one because there'll be another one next year. So right. it's not worth fighting over anymore. Um, I mean, we're killing ourselves as hunters. We don't, we don't need to have the anti hunters jump in because we're fighting so much amongst ourselves that it's just absolutely crazy. And so, um, you know, we just need to get along, manage the way we want to manage. And if we can all manage it together in one group, Hey, great, you know, do it and run with it. Let's, uh, back up and talk back to the study that you took part in. Did you happen to harvest any of the deer that had the collars on them? I did not. Um, a lot of them, well, I shouldn't say a lot of them. I had two of those that were really good three-year-olds that I was really hoping to get through. And, uh, I had a couple different neighbors ended up shooting them. Um, a couple of them dispersed quite a ways out. We uh, found one of the five-year-olds dead, um, and then we found a two-year-old dead. Last year, I had a, just an unbelievable two-year-old, great, great deer. And all of us had decided nobody shoots that deer. We called him ear tag. His collar had fallen off. I actually... Remember, I was driving down the road one day in my UTV, and I just about hit it laying in my um, UTV path going to my tree stand. I was checking the stand. I come around. I was laying there. I just about hit it, so I stopped. I called Wes, and I said, hey, man, I've got a fawn out here. It came out. We collared that fawn. Um, it popped the collar, and he called me. He says, can I go in your place and get that fawn? I got a mortality signal from it. Um, I said, yeah, go ahead. And uh, he called me up and he said, all I got is collar, ripped the collar off. So you still got it running around. And um, so we just had ear tags. So we called them ear tag. And uh, last year, that deer at two and a half, like I said, he was he was a great deer for two and a half. He was a 137-inch eight-pointer at two and a half years old. And uh, a neighbor up the road let one of his relatives in and his relative – didn't know the deer from a hole in the ground and shot it open day rifle season. Oh. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so he's gone and the neighbor was even frustrated because the neighbor had let it go a bunch of times because we knew how old it was. He was a good deer for a two year old right. deer. You know, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of people who'll never see a 125 inch deer. And so when that deer come walking through the woods, I mean, the first time I saw him, um, I had, uh, one of the guys that I hunt with that's in a wheelchair, I've redone a bunch of my property for him and um, I was sitting filming with him and that deer started coming through and I said, get ready. I said, there's a good buck coming and I hadn't seen what it was yet. And he pulled up his binoculars and he goes, well, that's ear tag. And I said, well, I said, you know how that works? And he goes, I know. Cause everything has to work just perfect for the guys in wheelchairs. Right. So I put no restrictions on them whatsoever. If you like it, you want to shoot it, shoot it. Okay. There's a few of them that I do that with. And he goes, I'm not, he's two and a half years old. He says, I want to see what that thing looks like down the road. And uh, I said, all right, you know, and um, so he actually passed it and let it walk. And then, you know, like I said, unfortunately, and you can't be mad. You don't know. I mean, maybe he would have died over the winter, got hit by a car, got eaten by a car. I, you don't know. Um, so you just, uh, you move on to the next deer and away you go. Right. So, yeah. Now we've got another deer this year that's two and a half. Um, he was one of the last deer we collared uh, as a buck. Last year at a one-year-old, he was just a nice, he was just a basket rack eight-pointer. Um, he's about at his ear tips this year. He's, um, I think he's going to be good genetic two and a half-year-old deer. So hopefully we can get this one down the road and um, kind of go from there. But no, I never really, you know, I'd seen him while I was hunting. I just... Uh, there were a few other deer on the farm that were either older or more intriguing to me to go after than those. And, and part of it, honestly, to me was I wanted to see them get old. I wanted to see the studies so I could see what they did as an old deer. You know, that was more important to me than shooting him and saying, yeah, I shot a deer with a collar on it. I just, I wanted to see what the study, what they were getting killed from. And, um, you know, so that was interesting to see how many were, you know, actually killed by hunters compared to bobcats kill quite a few, you know, in their first year. Um, the uh, coyotes actually kill a lot of fawns. A lot of the fawn predation was from coyotes and bobcats. 
um, hunters and cars. Uh, Northern Wisconsin, they did the same study like eight, nine years ago. And um, when I was talking to Wes about that, one of the biggest predators up there before the wolves really started um, was bears. Bears kill a lot of deer. So that was, that was pretty interesting to see that too. So, you know, now they finished the study or, or finished collaring deer in 20, the winter of 2020. Um, so the last that I heard um, from Wes and his group, Wes actually took a different job in the DNR. Now there's a new guy taking it over. Um, that a lot of the data will become public um, in 2024 because they're really waiting to see, you know, what these deer to get them out four years from the last one studied. So then, then you look at that and you'd have 10, approximately 10 to 11 years of data from all these deer that you can actually look at and say, okay, this is the real, you know, what they really did it for the real predation study. But for guys like me, I can look at it and say, okay, now I've got all this data on all these mature deer and do they really do this the same? And um, it's just, it's just, neat to watch again you know how they change from a summer range to a fall to a winter range and and how they do that and you know some people say it gives you an unfair advantage it gives you well again i can't see any of that data during hunting season it's just can't so i don't know if that deer you know got shot by a neighbor if got hit by a car what happened over the summer so I still have to go everything off my trail cameras, all the information that I'm gathering myself, you know, just trying to now think like a deer and figure that out because otherwise um, it is an unfair advantage. Right. And so we can't do that. Right. Sounds fascinating. Thanks for sharing kind of what you've learned about that. But now it's time for us to enter the lightning round. This is the part of the show where we, ask you some rapid fire questions. First thing that comes to your mind, uh, answer it right off the top of your head and we'll burn through these real quick. Are you ready? Okay. (laughs) All right, here we go. First question. What's your favorite state to hunt? Here at home, Wisconsin. Good answer. Good answer. All right. Second question. Favorite tree stand snack. I usually don't snack in a tree just because I don't like the scent. So, you know, it's, it's water. That's usually all I have with me. I don't, you know, unless I'm sitting all day, if I'm sitting all day, then man, I usually just like take granola bars. That's about it. What in the, you're going to have to beat me up, beep this out. I mean, I'm going to be, these guys get me swearing. I don't, I, you're killing me. You guys are killing me killing me man i'm sorry i mean even even as a fat guy dude that's all i have is granola bar <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that it cuts some weight but i get out of the tree and i still think i gained Jeez. weight it just sucks <laughs> so. all right and finally what's the most important factor in killing a mature buck in your opinion ingress and egress how to get to and from a tree stand without them knowing. That's a good answer. And maybe, Tom, we should have Art back on the podcast to talk about just that. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I know I, I'd like to hear more about that. I'd love to, uh, love to get on there and talk about that. It's, uh, there's a science to it. It's people think I'm crazy, but there's actually a science to it. And, and you talk to a lot of guys that, hunt and shoot um, mature deer consistently. And I'm not talking every year. I'm talking every every other year or whatever that are shooting mature deer, which I'm talking four, five, six-year-old deer and older. Um, that's most of them will tell you the same thing. It's how you get to and from your tree stand without educating that deer. Um, and that's how you're going to kill him. All right, Art. Where can people find you? on the interwebs and connect with you on social media right here at my house oh no um they can find (laughs) my office is here so i'm always here working man so 
Uh, if I'm not, if it's not hunting season, I'm out filming for the TV show. I'm usually at my desk, either editing or social media stuff or whatever I've got to do for the companies. But um, otherwise, they can uh, find me at www.arthelenoutdoors.com or Facebook page is the same. Art Helen Outdoors own the season TV and the same with uh, my Instagram account. Sounds like your buddy Easton kind of flew the coop here at the end. He uh, he got tired of listening to us talk. He did. He kept looking out the basement door here. There's been some rabbits, and he's been out trying to get the rabbits, so the rabbits must have disappeared. Oh, he heard you say his name. Uh-oh. He is now back. back. So, hey. Easton. So Steve mentioned, you know, and, and you kind of touched on it just a little bit, uh, your TV show. What uh, What channels – is, is your show on for people that want to want to watch? We are on the Sportsman's Channel, quarter two, uh, which obviously is over and done now. Um, so then it transitions to right now we are on the Hunt Channel, and that is a free app that you can get on your phone. You can get it on your computer. If you have Roku, uh, you can get it on um, your Roku, which is a free app on there too. Next quarter um, is definitely MOTV, and we're working on some things with Carbon TV to uh, go that route. If that route doesn't work, we will then be on Gen 7. So, But right now, everything is on Hunt Channel. Um, I would love to tell you that it's all on YouTube also. We do have some things, and are kind of transitioning that page over. Um, we decided to kind of slow down on the YouTube thing because we were all of a sudden losing hunts and missing hunts, and uh, they are now starting to take hunts down on YouTube um, if they don't like them. So um, we are going the other routes with the Hunt Channel and Sportsman Channel and things. So um, definitely find it on the Hunt Channel. Okay. So. Awesome. Well, hey, Art, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And we definitely look forward to having you back on the show. Love to be back, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us on the Rack Factor podcast, presented by Rack Fuel Premium Deer Nutrition. Listeners of the podcast can enjoy 20% off Rack Fuel Premium Deer Mineral feed or food plot seed by entering the code FACTOR, that's F-A-C-T-O-R, at checkout. Visit rackfuel.com now for 20% off premium deer nutrition products and fuel your herd. Hey guys, to celebrate the launch of our podcast, we are having a review giveaway. So if you found value in our conversation today, please share and write a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This really helps us get found by others in the hunting community. So write a review, take a screenshot, and email it to steve at rackfuel.com. We will pick one winner to receive a Rackfuel prize package as a thank you. Good luck.